Daisy Rockwell is a translator and an artist. She has translated many classic works of Hindi and Urdu literature including Upendranath Ashk's Falling Walls, Bhishma Sahani's Tamas and Khadija Mastur's The Women's Courtyard. Her translation of Geetanjali Shree's Tomb of Sand was the first South Asian book to win the International Booker Prize. Tomb of Sand also won her the 2022 Warwick Prize for Women in Translation. Rockwell has been a student of Hindi, Latin, French, German and Ancient Greek for many years. She received her PhD in South Asian Literature from the University of Chicago where she studied Hindi literature, translation and social sciences. Her book Upendrana Dash a critical biography was based on her PhD dissertation. In this conversation she spoke about her approach to translations and Upendrana Dash whom she greatly admires as a writer. Daisy Rockwell books on Amazon can be purchased using the link given in the show notes. So welcome uh, Miss Daisy Rockwell welcome to our podcast Arshniyam nice to have you with us today. Thank you for inviting me I'm glad to be here. How did you develop uh, interest in uh, reading and writing? Oh yes well definitely it was from the beginning I mean both my parents were avid readers and my grandparents so a very literary family and um you know my grandfather was a, a famous American artist my grandmother always read aloud to him while he was painting uh he loved dickens and uh my father recently told me that My grandmother read War and Peace out loud to him twice while he was painting. So I just telling you that to give you an idea of how much our lives are mm-hmm. steeped in literature and there's you know there are writers in my family although they're more artists. Right. Um uh, visual artists, but still uh but literature is is everywhere and um so I guess from an early age i was reading and writing little things and so on like that no you have taken up hindi and how did you develop interest in hindi well i um always have loved learning languages um i love grammar which a lot of people don't but i love grammar Um and my love of grammar started in about you would call class 7 so I was started latin class um and you know latin is considered a dead language and we don't even print we pronounce it with american accents so it's not even like learning a fun thing that you can speak to people or travel but um but we learned tons of grammar and I just loved it so much so that was play my earliest exposure to to translation even though it was real not pretty translation at all. Um and then I went on to learn I also was learning French and I studied German and some ancient Greek. Um so when I was in college I just decided I wanted to learn something that I knew nothing at all about. So people so Hindi kind of fit in my schedule and people are always expecting me to have some kind of interesting reason you know like a personal connection to india of some kind but i don't i didn't have any connection and that was one reason why i chose it i wanted something that just was completely opaque to me so hindi fit the bill <laughs> oh my god so you have not even uh, heard of even a hindi word uh, no before, like uh, i mean i barely had eaten you know maybe i'd had a samosa before or something like that that was like i didn't i was didn't do yoga or anything but that's something i enjoy about hindi is that cuz i like to be out of my depth in a way like cuz it's i keep learning right. so i love to always be learning more and so hindi i'm always out of my depth because you know it's such a huge language and you if you read or hear or speak to people like you can end up with a hindi that's sort of braj bhasha eyes or punjabi eyes mm-hmm. um i also learn urdu and urdu is a whole new you know ball game with lots of different vocabulary and so i love that hindi keeps me 
like learning all the time. You learned Greek, you learned Latin, you mm. learned French, Hindi, mm-hmm. Urdu, and of course English. So it makes six, totally. Yeah, there's more. There's more. <laughs> Can you please list them? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, I don't test me on this, but I did study in graduate school. I did study Tamil for two years and Malayalam for My two years. God. Um, and I've studied about a year's worth of Sanskrit, a year's worth of Arabic. Um, and then I love Duolingo, you know, the app Duolingo where you can learn a language. And so the languages I've studied the most on there are Spanish. Turkish, Arabic, and um, Korean. So in all these languages, you can read. Yeah, that's always important to me because I, I, I'm I, also an artist, you know, so like I I like actually learning scripts and writing systems. It's like Urdu, I love Urdu calligraphy and Persian calligraphy. Oh, I forgot to tell you I'm learning Persian right now. I have a teacher that I meet with twice a week on Zoom, and I've already gone through the entire grammar and we're reading short stories now. So Persian is immense fun because so much of the vocabulary from Hindi and Urdu is in there already. So it's like I don't have to struggle that much to remember the words. So totally in how many languages can you read and speak? I, I, I don't know. I mean, my standards are super high. So like to me, I know nothing basically. None of it. Like, I'm not any good at any of it. Now, uh, the first book that you wrote is a biography. Critical literary biography is what you called it. Mm -hmm. It's about Upendranath Ashk. Right. Uh, Why did you choose to write it? Right. Well, so to be honest, this book is actually my PhD thesis. So when I was in graduate school, I um, started to read Hindi literature a lot, and I was looking for a topic for my thesis. Okay. Um, And so, you know, part of the time, like, I'm sitting in Chicago, you know, so I have to make use of a library. So I read about different authors, and then I would try reading them. Um, So I read about Ashk, and, and the author that I read is a German Indologist, he compared Ashk to Proust, to Marcel Proust. Okay. Uh, and I was sort of intrigued by that comparison, so I started reading him. Mm-hmm. And I just kind of got lost in his world, you know, because he has this endless, well, it's not endless because he it ended when he died, but like until he died, he was writing this series of novels that um, all are go under the title Girti Divare, or falling walls, just like very slow moving and hardly any plot, um, but like amazing levels of detail that I find enchanting. I mean, I know it's not for everyone, but I love it. After uh, writing his biography, you wrote a nonfiction book and a novel. Right. That one was about the... um, global war on terror. Yeah, yeah, right. So, um, because I... um, I after I left academia in about 2006. So then I just um, decided to focus on my painting and creative work more for a while. And I, I didn't anticipate that I would go back to translating or anything like that. Um, And so I was very like I was blogging at that time. And I also um, was really fascinated with media depictions of the war on terror and so a lot of my artwork at that time is about terrorism um so that little book the little book of terror is essays and paintings on that subject um and then i wrote a novel just because i wanted to try that and then around that time somebody talked me into starting to translate again. I actually had a full manuscript of Ashk's short stories that was unpublished because I'd had trouble finding a publisher. So this person um, had a contact at, an, who was a new editor at Penguin India who he thought would be um, receptive. So I try, I had tried Penguin India before and nobody wanted it. So, but she took it and then I kind of got pulled back into the translation game um, probably starting in around 
2011-2012, I started to translate a lot. You may take care of Marjan in a workshop, right? He was a professor in my uh, university. And and um, so I had taken one class with him when I was um, in the BA program, uh, but not a translation class. Mm-hmm. It was like more about folklore and things like that. And then I took, uh, my first year in graduate school, I took his seminar on translation, uh, which was just amazing and a wonderful experience. And then very tragically, he, and unexpectedly, he died of just like a month later after that class so I had sort of imagined that you know since beginning of my beginning of my graduate school experience I had imagined that the whole thing would be like this you know just this wonderful translation and everything right Uh, but then once he was gone I couldn't focus on translation for my PhD because it was considered like not very scholarly by the people that were there if he had been there, he would probably have gotten me permission to do it, but he wasn't there. So I had to, so it kind of changed the course of my studies and probably basically sent me on the wrong track, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in terms of what I'm interested in and yeah. what I would like to be doing. So that's why academia eventually became um, an unpleasant thing for me. What was your biggest takeaway from his interaction you had with him? Yeah, I mean, everything he said was, was very interesting. And it was a um, class, people were translating from all different languages. Um, and so, like, not languages he knew, just any language he was willing to work with you on. Um, and so, one of the things that I really took away was that he pointed out that if you're translating a longer work, you can teach your audience certain words or um you know certain phrases in in the language you're translating from so like he pointed out if you read if you've read like the great russian novels um you get used to stuff right like things you've never heard of you can tell they're eating soup or whatever and you just you get over it and you learn it or like you know words for specific article of clothing or you know anything like that so so the point is it can't there can't be too many of them, but you can pick certain words. So I really took that to heart and it's kind of developed into a more elaborate philosophy for me, which is that I think of like when I'm getting ready to edit my translation to like form it into something that reads well in English, I I kind of decide for myself, what are my words going to be? What kind of words am I going to teach? Right. Um and like, what are what are words that I don't want to put in English because it just sounds dumb? In Urdu novels, and sometimes Hindi novels, but in Urdu novels, there's always this piece of furniture called the tacht, right? Right. Uh, which is like a platform-ish thing, right, that you sit on. Everybody's sitting on it, and they eat on it, and they sleep on it. Like, it's like a very important thing. So... I don't want to call it the platform and I can't call it the bed. So like tacht is a good example of a word that like, let's just keep it, you know, and they'll, they, and the readers will come to understand that it's something that everyone is doing everything on, you know, like that this is, they're sitting on it. And, um, so that kind of thing I think about, um, a lot. So that's one thing he taught me another, one of his famous, sort of sayings was that every footnote is a confession of failure (laughs) and then I've had to explain this to some people because they think he meant like in all writing like in you know anything no it's like he didn't mean it in anything he meant in translations every footnote is a confession of failure and of course what he meant by that was if you have to drop a footnote down that means you can't come up with some way to deal with this problem right um so i i really take that to heart i absolutely am against putting footnotes in my translation because there's so much you can do in line and again but then also you don't need to give people crutches all the time like the way going back to the russian soup you know people are smart and they can figure things out so um so you just sometimes you have to give them like a little nudge or something but you don't need to drop a whole 
footnote and have a paragraph explaining some custom or something like that. Like, they'll get it, they'll figure it out. And and if you think about your own reading experience, like here you are sitting in India, and I bet you've read lots of literature set in the United States or in Great Britain, full of experiences you've never had and environments you've never seen, but you can figure it out. You like you have no problem with it. Correct. Um. So, like, the, the human brain can handle these things. So I think that he, um, both of those lessons are sort of on the same subject and, and I think really inform my practice as a translator. Really nice. When you started your journey of translations, you wrote a biography on Ashk, and again you started with Ashk, Upendranath Ashk. Mm-hmm. And you wrote two novels and the short story collection also was published. Mm-hmm. What is that uh, particular aspect of his writing which made you actually <laughs> repeatedly go back to No, it's a good question because I think a lot of people don't really understand what what I uh, like about him so much. Um, um, one thing is his humor. I think that he's really funny in all different ways. You know, like sometimes it's like a laugh out loud and sometimes it's subtle and... Um, and there's parody and all different kinds of humorous things in his writing. So I love that. Um, and then I love details. Um, I love how he'll just, the character will just stand and watch somebody making like the Smith making keys and locks or like, or the soda water walla making the soda water. Um, you know, and he describes every single aspect of it and it's not only interesting um aesthetically but now it's also an archive of things that nobody knows about or sees anymore so like this tremendous detail about Lahore and Jalandhar that um in a a world that doesn't exist at all really because it's pre-partition and so it's um, not segregated by partition, um, but also just modernization came so rapidly. So, so many of these things really changed dramatically. So when I translate these books too, I have to do tons of research because there's a lot of things that aren't in dictionaries that nobody, younger people have no idea about. So I'm always, you know, looking for the Punjabi grandparent um, if anybody has a Punjabi grandparent, you know, because there'll be <laughs> children's games or like things to eat on festival days, yes. and you know that nobody d- eats anymore, nobody plays these games anymore. So yeah, so I love that. He was very famous for his uh, forwards, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> picking up fights with critics and uh, even with Mahadevi Verma. Really feisty difficult guy and um you know i think i quote his one of his chelas um in the book okay. ravinder kalia he wrote a he wrote an article about how um ash was yeah. always picking fights like that there's this inner pahlwan in ash and that he just always has to pick fights you know he had woke well, grew up with all these brothers and you know so um and he's Punjabi for it was, you know, I mean, he would say that as part of the reason why he's part Pelvan. So like with Ravinda Kalia, he said that every time something went wrong, he would say, you know, oh, Kalia Kahat is me. You know, I like, I am sure that like my glasses are missing. Kalia Kahat is me. You know, that kind of. So yeah, it's just like he just couldn't stop. And even when I met him myself. He was like really difficult and kind of scary to talk to because I was young and, you know, a great admirer and I was just sort of terrified of him. I was in Allahabad um, on and off for about a year and a half. And um, and during that time he died. Um, so this is, you'll see this is a theme in my stories. And then he died. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, that made it kind of me kind of confused because that was about six months into my research stay. So after that, 
I think my focus changed a lot because when he was alive, he was very keen on controlling the narrative and like trying to make me focus on certain things. And then once he was gone, I started to talk to all different other people and get their views. And it was interesting. <laughs> yeah. And in this book, you wrote about his autobiographical technique also in most of his books. Can you can you please take us through that? Yeah, so so his main character in the Girti Divare series is named Chetan. And Chetan is like Ashk in many ways. For example, you know, he's the same age and gender and he wants to be a writer. And his family is very similar, has the three brothers and you know like it's all extremely similar basically like you might even call it um nowadays like it's called auto fiction right you know but um when you when you write fiction but it's very very um autobiographical um however however the character chaitan that he creates um around himself like based on himself is not for example, what we just talked about, this irascible, difficult guy. Chaitan is not like that. Right. You know, he's kind of clueless and innocent and bumbling. And he's just like always failing. He wants to be a writer and he's just bad at it. And he can't quite understand. And he's just always trying different art forms, you know, like learning instrument or or he was in the play Anarkali. Um, and, um, and he imagined himself as Prince Salim, but he was cast as one of the Kinesis, one of the slave girls. So he's like incredibly humiliating, humiliating. So, um, so I think by portraying himself or portraying the main character this way, of course, the, the, the protagonist as kind of a bumbling idiot allows you to, um, describe things in more detail, you know, like to his experience of the play and of or of an instrument or of a certain poet is like goes into incredible detail because he's so clueless that he has to go over it in in incredible detail. The novels you translated, other than even Ashkis, uh, I think nineteen thirties, nineteen forties. Right. Mm -hmm. Even the other mm -hmm. novels you translated, except one, I believe, uh, that Priyamvada's recent one. Other than that, all of them they belong to the 1940s, 1930s, pre-partition or after the partition. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, some of them, like I think, oh, um, women's courtyard is 60s. Um, but anyway, it's all it's all earlier, and um, that is that is kind of my era um and the reason i think is that it was a time of um, optimism and experimentation mm -hmm. and a lot of people were sort of jumping into literature and feeling hopeful because of um the end of colonialism or like even the independence movement um just made a lot of people feel hopeful uh Pre prem chand rabindranath tagore the Progressive Writers Association, all these things were sort of hopeful notes that drew smart young people. And another thing that drew them in was that um, All India Radio was hiring tons of writers to write like radio plays and um, other kinds of content for the radio. And a lot of writers were also at in uh, Bollywood writing screenplays like serious writers uh, were there, writing lyrics or screenplays. And so it was a hopeful, exciting time for writers in India and um, lots of experimentation of kind of feeling that you could do anything, um, you know, that this is the moment. And so I, I really enjoy that uh, moment. And also a time of tremendous change. Um, which makes it very interesting. So customs are changing. Um, so we, for example, if you, if you want to write about a romance, yeah, um, how do you do that when it's an earlier framework when like women are just not going out of the house or something like that? 
If you write a romance around partition, then everybody is knocked out of their houses and anything can happen, right? So um, so there's this, yeah, this kind of turmoil also brings about interesting stories to tell. No, you are an artist too. Mm-hmm. Yes. Tomb of Sand, uh, I think the cover spread, uh, you only created it, right? Yeah, and the Indian edition. The Indian edition, yeah. yes. Yeah. And you have a collection on Flickr. I think there are about 350 or 360 icons. Yeah, lots of paintings, yeah. <laughs> Why did you name your Flickr account as Lapata? Oh, that's my, um, you know, the, there's an Urdu word for an, um, a writing name. It's Takallus. Uh-huh. And so my Takallus is Lapata. And... Um, and uh, the reason why I chose it was because after I left academia, a friend who runs a blog, because uh, in those days everyone was blogging, which they aren't now, but uh, called Chapati Mystery. So it was kind of South Asian related stuff. He asked me to write for the blog. It was a very popular blog. And I said, well, I don't really want anyone to know who I am. And he said, well, you just pick, you know, a handle or something and Nobody will know. I chose that because after I had left academia, then people kept saying, what happened to you? You disappeared. What happened? Where did you go? So I like it's. I mean, it's especially funny when you're speaking Hindi and English is not as funny, but in, in Hindi, then people are, you know, like, and they just start laughing right away. You know, cause it's, like, because it's you are Lapata or you are missing. Like the, like the pun is very funny. So, okay. um, Anyway, I just stuck with it and I started signing my paintings. I write in Urdu in the corner Lapata. Um, and so for a while, nobody even knew that I was Lapata, like a year or two. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, but even when I, you know, my identity kind of came out, I continued to use it at, at least to sign my paintings. Not in my writing. I don't use the name, but yeah. When you are translating... Mm-hmm. How do the artist and writer come together? Yeah, well, sometimes they don't. <laughs> I mean, a lot of times it feels like they don't have anything to do with each other. But then I have had people say to me recently that my translations are very visual. Yes. I mean, I'm just translating what the person wrote. But um, part of my practice as a translator is to envision. Mm-hmm. what mm-hmm. You know, because sometimes if you just literally translate what the author wrote into English and or from a language that's very different from English or whatever in between two pairs a pair of languages that's that are not very similar if you just translate it literally the essence is not conveyed because you're unable to visualize what's happening you know so so I'm always visualizing um you think about architecture, you think about kind of the 3D of every scene. Um, like I, I like to give the example, if you saw, it says the door slammed, like what kind of door is this? What is it made out of? Uh, you know, like uh, like a lot of doors in India have, are two flaps, you know, like two panels, right? Is- so if the door slammed, it sounds very different from uh, like an American door. So, or is it made of wood or is it made of metal or, you know, plastic or whatever? Like you, you have to think about these things to make the sound clear, like what it would sound like or what it would look like. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, so there's a, there's a visualness to my translations, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, in my artwork, there's a lot of text, especially lately. I've been writing a lot of um, calligraphy into my paintings from Udu so um, so they sort of come together in those ways but it's not exactly like a hand and glove fit now when I was reading Ashk right falling walls and mm-hmm. the kind of fine detail he gets into mm-hmm. probably the trite of Ashk I thought that is what uh, attracted you as an artist I felt in his writing yeah yeah I think you're probably right because it is a very so much visual description. Yes, yes, you yes. You know, yeah. So having that artistic bent of mind, probably that's what attracted you to Ashk. That may be one of yeah, the reasons. Yeah, yeah, no, think. you're right. Yes, that's definitely an aspect of it. And I like how he also, as an artist, 
how he finds art in everything yes. too. You yes. know, like yes. in the soda water bottles and in the locksmith and you know, like everything he sees is like a craft, you know, sort of makes you think of the craft of creating something. Right. Um, right. So I, that I find very attractive. Tomb of Sand, which won the Booker, mm-hmm. was the first of your books, which was published outside India. Right. It, uh, and of course, it went on to win the Booker, the first one which got published outside India. So in the intervening period, right, did it really bother you that uh, you know, books were not getting published outside India? Did it really bother you? No, absolutely. It bothered me a lot. It still bothers me. You know, because you think since I won the book earth that people would say, oh, yes, let's take this and let's take that because you translated it. But there is still like not at all a an appetite for South Asian literature and translation outside of um, Asia. And, um, you know, I think it's a bit, uh, to be frank, a bit racist um, because... There is a sense that um, it's too far in, um, you know, maybe it's a little bit third world or something. Um, you know, people don't realize, I think, that taste, the way we think of taste and what makes something good or bad, that that these things can be inscribed with um, racism or, or like colonial mindset. Um, and so I feel like that's a big problem and I'm always trying to push against it. And everyone I know, all the other translators I know, are always trying to get the books published outside of India. And it's extremely hard and hardly anybody, um, is successful. And so we do hope that there'll be a tomb of sound effect, but you know, too often we now hear people saying, oh, yes, we want something just like that, you know, like with crows that talk yeah. and stuff. There, I'm sorry, but there's no other book like that book, like in any language. That book is unique. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, that too, it was published by a fellow translator, right? Who won the book? Yes, yes, yes. She won the first of this current version of the International Booker Prize. She won the first one in 2016. Yeah, Deborah Smith. So she, Deborah, who runs Tilted or ran Tilted Access Press, she was scouting uh, manuscripts in India, and she was had heard about Gitanjali Sri. I think she read my her book my in translation, which I didn't translate. Mm-hmm. She heard about this new book Read Samadhi that had come out, and she asked Arunava who should do it. Mm-hmm. And Arunava recommended me, which was flattering. And so I um, did a sample, which was like way harder than I thought it was going to be because it's such a really incredibly difficult book to translate. Um, but she, in the, in the end, she decided she wanted to do it. Um, so, yeah, so we went, uh, went ahead and did it. This Retiki Samadhi, which was uh, in the Hindi version of uh, Tomb of Sand. Mm, how is it different from your other translations as far as uh, the effort is concerned? Uh, like much harder. <laughs> um, because, yeah, so it's like ton, there's tons and tons of wordplay and puns and just kind of like echoes of words. Like a lot of times she uses words not for their meaning. It's more like poetry in a sense. In a way, it's like an enormous poem. Oh, and so poetry is different to translate. You can't translate poetry the same way as prose because you have to be thinking about sounds and rhythms and all these things. So I had to think about that for the entire length of that book, and that's that's extremely difficult and exhausting. Do you think uh, this, uh, the way poetically it is written, poetry gives more latitude as a translator when you're translating it? Well, it can, but it can, you know, it's like if you have too much rope, you might hang yourself, right? So, like, (laughs) latitude is not necessarily a good thing, and translators love the constraints of their craft, you know, that you have, you have, are working within very tight constraints. So, um, 
I mean, I partly had to get her permission to. She okay. she gave me permission to pursue the wordplay in English um, as wordplay in English because it had to reflect the the spirit of what she had done. But is when it, you're literally using different words, you can't do the same thing, you know. Of late, uh, you're translating only women writers. Yes. Is there any particular reason for that? Yes, yes. Um, so, I mean, I think it started. It was around the beginning of the Me Too era, so it was sort of in the in the air. Okay. Um, and also a lot of statistics coming up about how few women are published, and it's the same is true with translation. Very few women are translated in comparison to men, and that's across languages. But it's actually especially bad in South Asia, um, and. I also started to get really just sick of um, reading books by men where women's feelings or just experiences are kind of routinely ignored. Um, so, like, um, there was a particular scene in Shehame Gumta Aina that I talk about um, where this woman is beaten up in a cast rivalry and she's lying on a charpoy in the middle of the um the muhalla mm-hmm. and um and everybody starts to fight over how to deal with the situation and it goes on and on and on and on and like i was actually never you're not sure for a long time if she's even alive um because of like the verb marna in Hindi can mean beat or hit or kill, and it depends on the context you can tell. But I couldn't, you couldn't actually tell in this case because she didn't say anything, and there was nothing from her perspective of like she felt this way or she looked sad or anything like that. She's just not. You just know she's lying on the chair point, but you know you're not actually sure if she's alive or not. Um, so, um, and at the same time, I was reading Victor Hugo's Les Miserables in French to keep my French up, and it's a sort of similar um, treatment of Fantine, the character Fantine, where where Jean Valjean is looking after her. She's very sick, and then he gets all obsessed with this his identity being revealed, and he goes riding off and like there's many descriptions of all the horses he rides and his feelings and everything and he just like seems to forget about her for you know a hundred pages or so and then he comes back and she's dead (laughs) (laughs) and so like like these things are very common in literature written by men and i don't i'm not saying that like these men are horrible people or anything but that that um, because of patriarchy, men don't have to think about how women think and feel. And so it's a blind spot. And you can see the same with any power relation. So in terms of caste or race or class or all these things, you'll see these these discrepancies right. in the writing. So um, so I just decided that, that f- I started not with translation, but with reading, with my own personal reading. I decided I was not going to read books by men for like a year. Um, and then I decided I would, My I noticed that my translations were all of male authors. I just hadn't paid attention. I thought it was coincidental, but I decided I had to even it out. So, so my first idea was I was going to even the score, like I'd have as many women as men. Um, but then, like... I don't know. I just once I got going on it, I um I didn't really want to stop because I was making so many discoveries about um how richly women writers describe their experiences and feelings in a way that you just don't see. And of course, in an uneven power relation, the person that's um on the you know, the bad end of that, the short end of it is uh, is also able to perceive the feelings and experiences of like the women understand what the men are going through. So it's not like they ignore men's feelings, 
Um, and you'll see again, as I said, the same in something that like um, when you're thinking about race or caste or class or something like that, that the person who's more oppressed is has perfectly good insight into the other party. So I find this very fascinating and I'm not done being fascinated by it. So I'm continuing to do it, even though, you know, the volume three of Kirti Divare is undone. Yeah. But it's also, I'd like to add 800 pages so I'm not in a super big hurry, and the only person so far that wants to read it is my husband. So, you know, okay. if, maybe there's a, a greater demand. Like if you read Shehir Megum Ta'ayna, The Mirror Wandering in the City, if you read that one, yeah. if you read that one and you write to me and you say, Daisy, I must read volume three, then that'll be two people that want to read it. So, you know, maybe <laughs> I'll be persuaded. <laughs> no, I have the book with me. I have a... I bought uh, Shehir Mein Gumta hai na, that uh, Wandering Mirror, and also Khadija Mastur's. Ah, good. And I have to tell you this this funny fact about volumes one through three of Falling Walls. Oh, so you yeah. know at the end of Falling Walls that he and his Bahai Saab have, are fighting, right? That they stop speaking right at the end. So then volume two is The Mirror Wandering the City, and it's one day in his life, and it's the next day from Falling Walls. It's the literal next day. So he's still like that whole book, you don't see by Sab, and he's not speaking to him for the entire volume. And then, and then the third volume, he goes to Lahore and to find by Sab. And so they finally speaking it again. So they're not speaking for like that entire. Okay. Interim, and then he goes, and they have like another fight immediately. Um, so it's just like a very funny thing that he sustains that Bicep is one of the main characters in these novels, but he sustains this this like period of um, you know coldness between them for uh, the whole this whole book. Totally, there are six and half books, I believe. He has not finished it, right? Six-ish, yeah, like six and a half, kind of. Six and a half. So you have done two (laughs) of them now. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like I said, the next one is 800 pages, so. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Okay. Now, um, when it comes to translation, do you Mm -hmm. see translation as some kind of literary activism? No, yeah. I, I mean, it doesn't have to be. Uh, it depends on how one chooses one's texts, but I tend to fall into the activism category, like that I want to raise women's voices. I want to, um, like to bring South Asian literature more into the world. Um, that I'm interested in progressive literature, not in the doctrinal way, like that we were talking about before. Uh, like I don't mean the kind where it's sort of Soviet style, you know, rubber stamping yeah. or something like that. But progressivism in its uh, more pure sense, I think that um, has a lot to offer to readers and to society. Now, you have been in the field of translation for over two decades, I think two and a half decades, if I'm right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, have you observed any changes in the field of translation during this period? In the way translations are perceived, translations are done? Yeah, a lot. A lot has changed. I mean, in, I was in India in the 90s um, when translation started to take off. Uh, so like Penguin India and Rupa were both publishing, starting to publish translations and there hadn't been that much before. Um, and so that was exciting and I, you know, I still have a lot of those books, um, on my shelves. That's some of those first ones. Some of them are really good. Some of them are really, really bad translations, but, um, because there was no, it was, it's still not particularly professionalized field, you know, so like anybody can try their hand at it if they can get the rights to a certain book and you you know you have no idea how it's going to end up because there's not uh, really uniformity in editing or anything like that so um but now i think translation in in india has really taken off and has become very popular and but that 
is parallel to outside of India as well, because and that I credit mostly to, in fact, the International Booker Prize, because um, by deciding to give the award in equal sums of money and um, to both the writer and the translator, they have like automatically raised the status of translators quite a lot and that not just the status but the visibility um and so since then for example one of the people that's the biggest activist about getting translators names on the covers of books is jennifer croft and she was one of the winners of the award so um it's given people a platform to speak out on these subjects um and to ask for better pay for better recognition and so on so worldwide i think there's been a big change in how translation is perceived, which is obviously great. <laughs> what are the upcoming books? Um, well, I'm currently translating an Urdu novel um, that the title is TBA because okay. nobody likes the one that I came up with. But anyway, <laughs> it's set in 1930s uh, Northwest Frontier provinces okay. um and lahore and um it's by a pashtun author named nisar aziz but and um she uh this novel is semi-autobiographical but i say i like to say it's like middle march meets magic mountain um because there's a long part in a tv sanatorium and there's a fiercely intellectual heroine um it's a very difficult novel to translate because she writes long, hard sentences. And I was complaining to a friend the other day that it's like trying to translate Nietzsche or some philosopher. Like there's all these very long, convoluted thoughts about death and, you know, everything. Um, so I'm working on that. But then on the lighter side of things, I'm really into this Urdu um, gothic, kind of horror writer from the same period. Uh, she was writing like in the 30s and 40s uh, called um, uh, Hijab Imtiaz Ali. Um, and so I'm reading a lot of these horror stories that she wrote and they're very actually kind of funny. I don't think she's trying to make anybody scared, but they're <laughs> I love that. Um, and then of course there's Gita Anjali Street to look forward to um, and uh, very soon I'll begin work on her only um, untranslated novel, which is called Hamara Shaher Osbaris, okay. uh, which I'm calling Our City That Year, which is exactly what that means. And, um, and it's about the aftermath of the riots in Gujarat following um, the demolition of the Babri Masjid. Um, and... So it's set in a Gujarati city and um, it's about three writers in search of a way to describe what's happening, the breakdown of society. Um, and none of them are able to do it. So the narrator is a fourth writer who says she's not a writer at all and doesn't know what she's doing, but she's just going to copy down everything that happens and, um, in, you know, because the other three have a writer's block and they can't seem to accomplish anything. So it's, yeah, it's her, definitely her most overtly political novel. Now, finally, can we have suggestions for youngsters who want to get into translations? First thing is you have to get rights to the word. If you want to publish something, you have to get right the right to translate it. And that can be really tricky. With a living author, you have to track them down. With a dead author, it's even worse because you have to find their heirs and their heirs can be non-literary and not understand what's going on and try to get money out of you. So your best bet, if you can think of anything, is to find somebody out of copyright. <laughs> so that means somebody that's been dead six over 65 years. It's, it's, so that's my first piece of advice. Find Find yourself an author that's been dead for more than 65 years. <laughs> <laughs> then my second piece of advice is translation is not the simple transfer of one language to another. It is a artistic and literary activity. Yeah. And 
Um, it takes a lot of drafts to get to that point. So if you've only done two or three drafts, then you've only just begun. And I tell people that you should always try do a minimum of 10 drafts for anything. And if you haven't done that, then you're not done. That's oh. in my opinion. Okay. Um, and then the last piece of advice I would have is that you have to be ready at some point to let go of the source language. And a lot of people have trouble do that, doing that because they, a, lot of, a, a lot of translators really love the source language and literature, right? So they're doing it out of a love and a service to the language. And I get that and I'm totally with you, right. but you can't take it with you. Like uh, my, this is a funny saying, my, my husband's grandmother was Irish. And she she always used to say, shrouds don't have pockets. Okay, so like the idea is you can't, when you die, you can't take anything with you. I mean, there's versions of this throughout the world. But so just like, that's my advice to you. Shrouds don't have pockets. And like when you get into, finally get into English, you're, it is a work in English and you are going to have to let the other thing go. You can't take that text with you. You're creating a new one. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time, Daisy. Thank you. It was wonderful listening to you talking about that. No problem. Yes, it was great fun. Thank you.